Hey, what's up? Welcome back to Project Freelance. My name is Kay Anagonio and I am your host on this podcast where we talk about freelancing. Every single week I have a different guest on to tell you guys how they built their business. And this week I have Eli James on. He created a brand called Ghost Circus Apparel and I've been trying to get this guy on the podcast for a while. Our schedules keep clashing and we're just so busy that it's been super hard to get him on the podcast, but I finally got him on. I'm super excited to share this episode with you guys. But first, I got another ad for you guys. We have a book out called No Tracers, an Urban Explorer's Diary. And by we, I mean me. I, I don't know why I said we, but I guess like we, the community. We have a book out called No Tracers, an Urban Explorer's Diary. And I made a little advertisement because I like to make advertisements. I really enjoy doing voiceovers. And so I made another advertisement for my book, No Tracers, an Urban Explorer's Diary. If you guys want to check it out, you can go to justletterk.com slash no tracers. Here's the ad. Enjoy it. And then we'll jump into this episode. There are abandoned malls all over the country, but Hawthorne Mall is one of my favorites. This place is massive, full of nothingness, and rarely guarded by security. There were no handrails to be found in this entire facility, which not only added to the danger, but it also added to the eerie look of the mall. I was definitely more aware of my surroundings on this day than ever before, because of the nature of what we do and how we capture our content. Ever since I was little, I've only ever gotten vertigo in shopping malls. For some reason, I have never trusted the railings made of glass or metal. Something about it just doesn't seem stable to me. If you weren't paying attention, you could easily walk off of floor three and end up on the ground floor in an instant. Talk about vertigo. Imagine walking around Dubai Mall with no railings. This is why we don't go on the roof. <laughs> this exact reason right here. I absolutely loved getting to explore this place and think it's permanently off my list of exploration spots. I don't need to go back here again, but I might. For more urban exploration stories, Visit justletterk.com slash no tracers and pick up your copy of No Tracers, an Urban Explorer's Diary today. Use code SPOOKY2019 for 10% off your order. I hope you guys enjoyed that little ad about my book. That's an excerpt from No Tracers, an Urban Explorer's Diary. Like I said, if you guys want your copy, I'll sign it for you and I'll personalize it and I will get it to you ASAP. Justletterk.com slash no tracers. All right, this week on the podcast, we have Eli James. I'm going to stop doing advertisements. I'm going to stop telling you about all the things, and we're going to jump into this episode. Eli, please introduce yourself and what it is you do to the audience. Well, uh, my name is Eli James. I'm a designer and uh, uh, fashion creator for Ghost Circus, and uh, I make money um, creating garments for a whole bunch of people, uh, different companies, different artists, and stuff like that. So let's go way back and tell me how you first got into design and fashion in the first place. Sure. So um, let's see here how I got into design stuff. Basically what it was is I was a musician. Uh, I mean, I'm still a musician. I'll always be a musician. But uh, I was a touring uh, drummer and a producer and, and all that stuff. And I was drumming for a whole bunch of bands. I was like this little band whore. <laughs> and... Uh, Anyway, and so um, as I was drumming for um, a whole bunch of uh, different uh, uh, artists and stuff like that, I decided to alter my own clothes, I believe as all artists kind of do. And uh, one day I had the idea of just making my, my stuff from scratch, and I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to do that, uh, but I was just like, ah, I'll figure it out. And so I started to get some fabric. I think I went to the nearest Joanne's fabric store and uh, started making my own clothes. And then, um, and it was actually uh, very interesting because uh, I would run around with, you know, wearing my own clothes and all my friends were like, oh my God, where'd you get that? That's so dope. And I was like, huh? They're like, I, I made it. <laughs> and they're like, oh shoot, dude, can you make me something? And, uh, uh, and I was like, sure, man. And, and, um, I was like, at first, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it for free because I, I, I just love to do it. And, you know, friends are like, okay, yeah. 
And then after I made my first shirt, I realized I couldn't do that for free. And it was like literally slavery just because of how long it took and all the money it took to, to get certain fabrics and all that stuff. And uh, one thing uh, led to the next. And I started making clothes for all my friends. And then other people kind of got wind. And I started designing for other companies. And then, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can go through a whole bunch of like, years of this stuff so that's basically how i got started so first of all good old joanne's i gotta say that thank you joanne's yeah shut up shut yes. up <laughs> <laughs> seriously they have some great fabrics it's kind of expensive they do have coupons but still kind of expensive <laughs> i love that you had to mention the coupons because it's it's a craft store it's a fabric store you know they gotta have coupons yeah, they do. They have really good coupons, too. So talk a little bit about um, how your role as a musician comes into play when it comes to fashion. Um, I know that music is a big part of your life. So talk about the influence that music has on, on your fashion and uh, the way that you went about creating your pieces. Well, honestly, um, I don't know. I, I, I really just had an idea... Um, from the beginning of uh, doing black on black on black on black and <laughs> just because I thought that was cool and, and then post-apocalyptic stuff was really cool and also uh, 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 a little bit of a throwback in the music was um, very 80s influenced so I was like how do I create post-apocalyptic stuff something that's raw edge but also the 80s kind of vibe and feel and dark and raw edge and um, that's kind of how it all all started, really. It was just, that's, I don't know, I just kind of added my flavor to materials that already existed. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it all kind of came together um, uh, pretty easily, to be honest. Um, it just, I was just having fun. And, and um, uh, a lot of the music that I did really helped influence what I did. So what was that first piece you created for yourself? What was that first outfit? Oh, uh, let's see here. I think the first thing I made was like these, a pair of drop crotch pants. And they were really fucked up. And it was so, it was gnarly because I, I like the fabric. But I didn't realize that there's different ways that the fabric is woven together and what a f the face of the fabric meant or anything like that. So I didn't know how it stretched and how it really was, you know, breathable um, until later. Uh, but uh, so it was really kind of hard to wear. But I made these pants that were really cool. It was just kind of hard to wear. And then the, I started making these cool shirts and they're like T-shirts with pockets and stuff. And, it, and, and um, yeah, that was like my first outfit. And then I I think I made like a cardigan or something and kind of created this cool layered effect. But it, but uh, I don't know, I just had fun with it, you know, like just kind of creating. I, I never had the idea or the thought of creating a business or creating a brand. I was just like, I'm going to make myself some, some cool shit and wear it while I tour. So talk about the first few years of, you know, starting to make custom pieces for people and, you know, how how word spread about your your brand that you weren't at first trying to create. Well, I, I yeah, the whole thing was kind of an accident, to be honest, um, uh, just because I I don't know, I started to do it. Let's see, it was in 2015, I believe. And um, at the beginning of 2015. And uh, I just started making stuff for myself. And then um, my brother, who's an illusionist, uh, you know, uh, obviously saw because we're brothers and we're, we live together at the time. And uh, he was like, rad, you know, that's so cool. And like started, started making stuff for him. And then word just kind of got out, like Frank Zumo, uh, he drums for some 41. And at, at the time, it was uh, Street Drum Corn. I think he was just getting into Cruella um, and touring with them. But we had a, a meeting and, and, um, uh, you know, we're like, we just hit it off right away. We're like brothers, you know? And, and he's like, dude, uh, you know, uh, you support me. I support you. Let's, let's make this thing happen. I was like, sure. Yeah. You know? And so ever since the beginning, um, word kind of spread fast through my friends, um, uh, and, you know, just different people like Tim Scold and then, uh, Ellen DeGeneres got a pair, a two pair of pants, and then I mean, uh, uh, Marilyn Manson did. 
uh, or hit not necessarily him, but his camp, his guitar player, and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of people started uh, recognizing it. And then uh, uh, I guess my uh, my friend Bobby um, he owns a company called Blackcraft, and uh, he hit me up and he was like, "Dude, your shit's legit. Uh, you know, we need to get a designer." Uh, for Blackcraft, and I was like, okay, that's cool. I'm doing Go Circus, but that's cool, <laughs> you know. And we went back and forth for probably about two and a half, three months, and he ordered some pants. And when he he ordered these pants, um, I drove him all the way down to where he was at. And uh, at the time, I was working at like an event company. I was making like five hundred dollars a week, and I was just making this stuff pretty much on the side but it got so overwhelming that I, I would work through the day and then right when I get off work I would be making clothes until two three four o'clock in the morning and one of these nights I just I made him some stuff and I drove it all the way down to uh, I forgot where he lived at the time sent I don't know down south like an hour and a half two hours away almost and um, uh, so I drove it down to him we did a fitting he's like dude these are legit this is so cool and then the next day, um, he called me, and I'm like, "Oh man, what what ripped? What happened? It, they suck. What's going on?" And he's like, "Dude, I got stopped three times within the last hour. We have to talk, man. You have to be the designer for for Blackcraft." And I was like, "All right, cool, man. We'll, we'll, we could talk, you know." And then, and I didn't know exactly what that meant uh, at the time, and how how cool of an opportunity that was, you know, for me as a designer, and for me just as an artist, and like me to help him out and and um anyway so it went from there so then we we uh we made a deal and i designed uh their first 20 i think it was 21 designs uh for the premium line to help launch the premium line uh moving forward and i was head of manufacturing for all that so we would i would design it and i'd bring it downtown to my guys and we do the patterns and the grading and the marking for the patterns and the cutters and the sewers and put everything together and we get like 300 units made and then we would sell it on their platform. And then, uh, one thing led to the next from there, it kind of grew and it, it grew so fast that I, they're down in Anaheim and I'm up in Los Angeles and I had to move, relocate my offices to the Los Angeles. And I would, I would visit them about once a week after that. And then, um, uh, just because of the demand got so big, I had, I couldn't spend time down there anymore. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, as time went on, more and more people, uh, started to hear about like ghost circus and the designs and the custom wear that we could do. And, uh, so I started doing custom stuff. I, I started uh, developing relationships for uh, cut and sew. Um, and then also at the same exact time by accident, uh, I started doing bleaching processes, which turned into this huge thing for Warp Tour in 2017. And like Circus Survive, Dillinger Escape Plan, August Burns Red, uh, State Champs, all, all these guys' merchandise uh, for Warp Tour we ended up doing. So I created the look of the bleach process and we actually did the bleach process in-house. And so it went, it was so weird because it went from me making my own stuff to me making, like designing and making things for other companies. And then it, it expanded into other departments. So I, I would actually do these processes for other brands and stuff. And then I had to get a, a warehouse. So I got a 5,000 square foot warehouse to do all the bleaching and then facilitate everything that was going on. And then it eventually, this last year, I, I invested into an embroidery department. And so uh, we got ourselves an embro two embroidery machines, and now we do embroidery for a whole bunch of uh, clientele. And so it's 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 kind of crazy, uh, and I don't know if this even makes sense, but it just went from an idea of making myself some clothes into this umbrella of a machine where we just – we have seven departments and they're all running at the same time. And, you know, from custom cut and sew to my own uh, label at Go Circus and we do fulfillment every day uh, into the embroidery department, um, into like uh, sourcing like uh, like bigger, uh, better blanks, I guess, for a less, uh, less amount for my friends. Um, and then we had a bleach uh, bleaching department, which came and gone and, 
uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of went uh, crazy, to be honest, from something so small to where it's at now. And it's it's almost, I think March 15th will be its five, four or five year mark, five year mark. Wow. So it's amazing to hear how how it's grown over the years and it's been five years and it's cool to compare it because I've been freelancing myself. This will be my fifth year coming up. And so oh, wow. I'm super excited to, you know, see what my fifth year has. And it's so interesting because I remember when I was studying film in school, my all of my professors are saying it's going to take four to five years for your business to really start taking off. And I was so impatient about it. I was like, no, it has to take off in the first year. Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? I'm moving to Los Angeles. Like, this has to work, uh-huh. you know? So talk about... Um, the process of, of this thing growing, was it like zero to a hundred? Was it like kind of a trickle? Um, tell me a bit more about the, the long waiting game process and what it was like to uh, build this thing. Well, um, just like, that's a great question. Um, and to be honest, like, I, like, I don't know, I think as, as entre- as an entrepreneur, I guess I always wanted it, things to happen so much faster and like, just get here and like, I want to make millions of dollars and like, let's, let's sell this company for $50 million. And, uh, to be honest, without the, without the little hiccups, without the mistakes, without the, oh man, I just lost $5,000 on that. Um, holy, holy moly. But at least I, I reordered and redid and reproduced and made a good product for this client. And, you know, moving forward, you learn all these things that if you were to explode and be this humongous entity all at once, it might be too much. And then that all of a sudden it, it, your company doesn't last that long. Where, whereas, you know, through this process, um, uh, it's growing, it's an everyday process and that it grows and it learns and it's, it's an organism. So it's, it's a living and breathing organism, really. Um, you got to feed it, you gotta, it's got to have its rest. It's got to have like, everything in in it just as you are as a human being you know where you have to have rest and sleep and eat and you know play time and all that stuff um it's kind of weird to describe it as that but it's literally a kid and um it can't run before it walks you know so the process as fast as it seemed that was going and is 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 um i mean you know, as big as it might look from the outside looking in, it's not as big as I would want it to be, you know, or it's not as, it's not making as much as I would hoped, um, you know, it would be or was turning into, but I never had a plan. So I wasn't really like, I didn't, I didn't really care for that, you know? Um, and at the same time, as exciting as it would be to be a millionaire and have all this stuff, it wasn't really about making money. Um, I think, I mean, we'll, we'll, I guess, let's see, we're, we're over a million now, but it's taken five years to get there. And, um, even, even doing that, it doesn't mean that I, oh, uh, we made a million. So that means I, I have a million. That's like, no, <laughs> you have so much business expenses, your CPA, your accountants. Um, so you don't get screwed. Your the IRS really likes to take whatever it can um you know uh you know you have your fees that you have to pay you have, do you have any employees do you have to have coverage for them the l and i um for those people you know and you're responsible for their car payment for their get gas to get there their food you know everything about that it's just it's so gnarly that it um you would think that it, it it's uh i don't know you would think that you would have a lot more um, but then when you really look at it like that, you go, well, shoot, I really need to make the 10 million so I can actually make some money. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, the, the growth process has been gnarly so far and, um, um, uh, it's been cool, but it's been gnarly. That's for sure. So there's a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of slow times, a lot of fast times. And I think at the end of the day, you just kind of have to let it be and have to let it grow on its own. Yeah, I, I've been learning that a lot about my own business is that you have to take time for it to rest. You have to, 
you have to throw the net out sometimes to try to catch more fish, especially as like a freelancer. Uh, we have to, yeah. we have to put that net out there to catch those new jobs. And so, you know, that applying for jobs and things like that is a huge part of my, my day, my week, you know, it's something I do frequently just to keep up. Um, so yeah, people that are listening to this, don't be afraid of the long haul cause it's going to take a while. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that, everything that you just said is very, uh, very true. Um, you know, yeah. And how long did it take to go from just doing it part time while you had other gigs, while you had other jobs, to doing it full time? Um, well, mine, I guess, if I look at it, was pretty quick. Um, it was like maybe two months or something. Yeah, but. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty gnarly. And at the same time, it wasn't like I had a humongous overhead. I, I split rent with my brother. I slept on his couch. I was a touring musician. I was like, you know, where, where can I economize in every which way so I can actually make this thing pop, you know, and, um, economizing while you go through the process is huge. It's like, if you, you know, there's a finances has, has a lot to it, you know, like if you, if you're, you have all of a sudden you pull in like a a thousand dollar job or something like okay a thousand dollars but that thousand dollars goes by real quick so better not spend any of it aside from just a little bit here and there to project yourself for the next thing and um saving is 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 huge too you know it's like yeah anyway so to to answer your question about about might have been about two months or something like that and i got extremely lucky and i i there was a lot of opportunities that came and humongous things that I was like so scared to do, but I just took the leap and had faith that I would come out the other end. Okay. And, and, um, uh, I mean, there's been probably about six or seven of those where I'm like, Oh my God, I'm either going to sink hard or I'm going to swim and it's going to be gnarly and it's going to be fun, you know? And so I just, I just swam as hard as I could and at, at whatever direction that was. So, um, have you, have you ever been screwed over on any jobs? Uh, yeah, yes, I have. <laughs> uh, yes, I have. I don't talk about it much. I won't say what the brand is. Um, but there was a negotiations, uh, uh, that we did. It completely ruined our relationship as business and as friends. But, um, anyway, uh, uh, so I, I would deliver um, gnarly things on on gnarly timelines, um, and uh, uh, let me see where I could I can communicate this without <laughs> killing <laughs> without, anybody. Without shooting yourself in the foot, please. Yeah, that too. I mean, you know, it is what it is. It just it's just you know whatever. But so basically, what it was is um, an owner of a company and a production manager hit me up and said, "Hey, this is when I was doing a lot of bleaching." And they're like, hey, we have 8,000 units coming your way. I said, sure. And they said, well, how many how, or how much can you get it done for? And I said, well, I'm going to – I you, honestly, it was $3.50 or something like that per unit. Um, that's how much it costs. That's how much we did things for. And, and, and um, that was a really good deal. Um, and our turnaround time is two weeks or so maybe even faster, whereas if you put it in a die house process, it's three to five weeks. And they really don't care. And they'll, they don't bulk fold it. They don't do the counts. They don't do any of that stuff, but we did. So there's uh, so it's like 350 or something like that. So anyway, so I told them it was like $2 or $2.15. And they're like, okay, cool. I'll get right back to you. And so two weeks go by, and then the production manager hit me up on a different thread and said, hey, so we have 25,000 units coming your way. And I said, okay, cool, no problem. Just let me know when the truck's going to get here and we're going to have to work out a deal because it's like we can do 5,000 a week maybe, you know. And they're like, okay, we'll work it out. And I said, okay, cool. And this is on top of doing all the bleaching for all those other bands, you know. It's, it, it's I mean, we'll do like 10,000 units a week and, you know, we want to be able to like operate smoothly and get a great product to everybody. But there's, you know, 30 or 40 employees underneath uh, me trying to get the same, all these things together. Um, anyway, so 25,000 units, I said, sure, no worries. They asked if I can throw in a couple of garments, uh, custom made garments. And I should, sure, thanks for throwing me work. I'll do the, I'll send you some garments. No problem. I'll make them myself and stuff. So I did that. And, um, 
then two hours go by and, and they hit me up and they said, oh, it's not 25,000 units, it's 2,600 units. And I said, okay, well, I mean, that's a pretty gnarly difference, but it's no worries. They've ordered 2,600 units before, no big deal. I was like, cool, just let me know when they're coming in. They said, well, can, can you actually go get them? I said, sure. So I went and got them and I brought them in and this was a Friday when I got them in. And we did a huge order Saturday, Sunday, and then to Mon starting Monday, we're finishing. And then the production manager said, hey, when is our order going to be done? And I just got them on Friday. So I'm like, well, two weeks from Friday, uh, um, you know, that's going to be the 15th, I think it was, or whatever. And they said, no, we have to have it this next Friday. Now, this is Monday, and they want it on Friday. So we have four days of production to get 2,600 units through uh, the process and this is like a four-step process. It's a gnarly process. It's it's crazy and To do that we have to do 20 hours a day with 15 people and So I said, okay, we'll make it work. I'll pay the overtime. I'll do whatever I can to make it work So I I literally had two hours of sleep every night until the order was done. I We finished at like 2 o'clock in the morning on Thursday Friday morning, so it was like a couple hours later, I woke up and I drove everything all the way down super south and dropped it off. And then I went to the uh, company to, to pay the invoice. And uh, uh, the production manager was like, well, what's this? And I was like, this is the invoice for the job. Uh, no, no pickup fee, no delivery fee, no rush fee, no overtime fee. This is, and you'll just pay your normal rate, no big deal, thanks for the work. And they're like, well, the guys aren't going to like this. The owners are not going to like this. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, this is way too high. You didn't, you said it was a dollar or something. I'm like, wait, what? Like I never said a dollar, nothing. It's always, but you've always had the same price, especially for 2,600 units. Anyway, so then they went back. They're like, Hey, I have to call the owners. And they went into another room and I'm like, well, why can't I, why can't you call them here? And they're like, well, the service here sucks. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So you're about to go talk crap about me. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. And so they came back like five minutes later and with just a shit inning grin on their face. I'm like, yeah, the, um, uh, oh, let me step back a couple, couple of beats. They were like, well, let me, uh, you know, um, I said, I can't do it for a dollar or something. That just makes no sense. I would never do it for that. Uh, you know, to break even, it would be like $2 and 39 cents or something. And so then they went back and talked to the owners, came back with a shit inning grin and said, okay, well, they'll match your price at two at two thirty nine, but that ends our business relationship. And I was like completely out of the blue, no warning, nothing at all whatsoever. And I was like, what? That doesn't make sense. Like, you know, I was like, okay, so sure, I'll eat $2,000. I'll meet their price if that saves the business relationship because whatever, you know, and then she went back, talked to him, came back, said, "No, they're gonna they're gonna give you the two thirty nine, um, and it ends the business relationship." And I was like, "Oh man, I I, I want them to write me this check." And I, I was like, "I think it was like eight grand or something," and I wanted to rip that up right in front of her and just throw it in front of her face, like, "I don't need you, I don't need this work, I don't need any of that." But I was like, "I might as well pay my guys." Anyway, so um, I broke even on that deal, but that completely ended the business relationship still to this day I have no idea why uh, aside from the fact that I can just assume what whatever the pro production manager was talking about uh, to save her own ass so but yeah there, that's 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 a pretty gnarly one um, uh, uh, yeah and what did you take out of that like what did you learn overall business wise from that I mean I know you didn't get any like resolution to it because you don't even know what you did wrong because you didn't do anything wrong it sounds like um, but what did you learn from that experience? Um, I just learned that you're, you know, these things happen and, and you're going to have probably plenty of these experiences. It's just business and not to take it personal and keep going because at the end of the day, you can't decide what other people think or want to do with their business, you know, and, but what you can do is you can deliver a great product. You can do your best you can. Um, uh, and you know, you can just be you. Uh, other than that, you can't. So, um, I have learned through the years that even if you have a client and they're a really good client and they're, they're like your whale of a client, well, get a whole bunch of more of those cause they're not going to be around forever. Yeah, absolutely. So 
Um, talk a little bit about, you know, seeing celebrities like mega celebrities, Ellen DeGeneres, Manson, these people wearing your brand. Well, it's, it's pretty gnarly. It's kind of crazy. Um, uh, yeah. When, well, there's one time actually, um, uh, Frank Sumo hit me up. He was doing the, I think the AP awards. Um, he was up for best drummer and he was like, Hey man, so it's me. It's going to be the, uh, Josh Dunn from Tony and pilots, but don't tell anybody cause you can't, I mean, it, it was a secret and Adrian Young from No Doubt, but we all want to get we all want to get some gear. So I was like, okay, cool. So when is this thing anyway? Cut like three or four weeks or something like that. They're like, nope, it's next week. I'm like, oh shit. So I literally like got up, went and met them at rehearsal, and I had three days to turn something over. And the thing is, like, you know, Adrian Young, um, which he's a ama- just one of the most amazing drummers and, and great people. Uh, is completely different style than Frank Zumo or or uh, Josh Dunn, um, and Josh Dunn's completely different than the other two, and and Frank is completely different than those guys. You know, one's rock, one's more pop pop rock, I guess, and the other one's punk and uh, a lot of plaid. And uh, so <laughs> I was like, oh shit! But it was so fun, and it was like it was just a really good time. Really, a lot of under the pressure stuff, but these. But at the same time, it was, it was phenomenal to see them. One, wearing my stuff, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I actually handmade all that stuff that they're wearing at this award show. And I went to the award show and I saw it live. And, and it, was, uh, it, was, it was gnarly. It was remarkable. I'm, I'm really grateful and, and, and you know, uh, thankful and blessed to be able to work with these guys. Um, uh, yeah, and I mean, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. I never would have thought. Uh, never ever ever would have thought and there's a lot more coming so that's which is nuts you know so I was recently gifted my first pair of ghost circus pants uh, and I love them talk a little bit about the materials you use now how how it how long it took you to find what you use now and why you use it um uh, well in regards to pants it really depends on which ones but um, I I have a um, it's a secret just kidding. Uh, no, I, I use a twill. Um, it's like this, it's like a cotton and, um, uh, like a little bit of a spandex, um, I guess like Lycra, it's like maybe 3% spandex and, uh, a polyester. And it's like this kind of a tri blend, um, material that's really like breathable and it's light and it's stretchy. So you could do a whole bunch of cool stuff on it and layer it up with, with, uh, itself and it'll look gnarly but it's light it's like you're wearing yoga pants or something you know and it's it's uh, kind of crazy so I don't know I I've always literally made stuff for myself and as a drummer and touring and everything like that I know how it feels to be on stage or really hot or you know even if you're not on stage and you're walking around especially Los Angeles but you, you have a cool style or you like to wear black well you have to wear a certain fabric so uh uh, luckily, I've I've been able to to uh, uh, source a whole bunch of great fabrics downtown, um, who now are my friends and stuff like that. Uh, uh, so I, I get all this cool fabric, and and um, that's really uh, the key. To be honest, with Ghost Circus, is the fabrics and materials of, of feeling comfortable, and then I just put a cool spin, or what I think is cool spin, to uh, to the garments itself. And what's it like to see other musicians wear your brand? Kevin Thrasher from Escape the Fate is, you know, another guy that wears almost only Ghost Circus apparel. Um, what's it like to have your friends and fellow musicians wear your stuff? Oh man, it's it's so cool. It's awesome. Like I, I Kevin Thrasher is 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 one of the coolest people in the world, um, and to, and he's a phenomenal artist. And just to see him. Um, uh, loving it and on stage and s- see it come to life. He really, he really like, like, I don't know, it, it, it becomes them, you know what I mean? So it, it's to see that and see everything come together. It's just, uh, it's a dream come true to be honest, you know, I mean, with him or Kellen Quinn, um, uh, actually it's funny because Kellen had hit me up, this is years ago. And then I told, um, I think I told Kevin about it and, and he was like, oh, yeah, we used to take uh, uh, Sleeping With Sirens on tour with us and stuff. And so they were friends for a long time. 
was like, oh man, that's so cool. It's such a small world, you know? And, and um, but he's another fantastic and amazing artist too that loves Ghost Circus. And I'm, I'm ever so grateful. Um, but it's cool. It's, it's really cool to see. And it's, it's, um, um, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's surreal to be honest. And what are some goals that you have for the future of Ghost Circus? Are you guys in any stores anywhere? Uh, well, we're, we're in a few stores on Melrose. We're in Black and Glam Squad, and then we're in Five and Diamond in San Francisco. Um, but honestly, it's just a step-by-step, day-by-day process. Um, I like to change it up a lot, you know? So I used to, like, release lines and stuff like that online, but now it's more like, what am I feeling right now? And I'll release one or two items, or uh, I'll release, like, it might come out as a line, but it's not really a line, and... and um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily have, um, a plan for it to be honest, cause that's not how it started. And then I don't think that's how it's going to end if it does. Um, and in my personal opinion as, as an artist and just as a dreamer and an entrepreneur is a lot of people say, Hey, what's your five year goal or whatever, you know, or two year goal, or whatever. Um, I never like to look at it that way. And the reason why is because it, I believe that that's limiting myself. So if I want something to be done in five years, well, if you're really telling the universe, I guess, if, if, you, if you believe in this, <laughs> if you're really telling the universe like you want something done in, within five years, well, that just adds time to what a phone call could be tomorrow. You know, So I, I just, at the moment, just allowing it to grow and be itself and kind of let my teenager become a teenager, you know? Um, and, and yeah, I mean, the word spreads and, and luckily uh, it's good news and good word and a lot of cool things are coming out and a lot of cool people are wearing stuff and, and I get to go on a lot of cool stuff like this. So, I, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I had to have you on. It's my excuse to get to know my friends better, to be completely honest with you. I mean, like, when have we ever had this much time to have a conversation? <laughs> Never. We'll see each other at, like, shows and stuff. Like, yeah, what's up? We're like, oh, my God, cool. I love you. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and then we'll like stuff from afar on, like, Instagram or social media and stuff like that. And we're like, dude, and we follow. I'm like, that's so cool. It's 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 good to keep it up and, and good that you're keeping everything going. But it's like, this is awesome. It's a good excuse for sure. Exactly. So thank you for bringing social media up. That was my next question. How has social media been integrated into your business marketing-wise, and what has it done for you? Um. That's interesting because there's two different answers to that. Uh, one, as as a brand, it's awesome. Um, through the years, uh, learning, um, I guess, I'm, I'm mainly on Instagram. I have connected to, to Facebook, but I'm mainly on Instagram with Ghost Circus. Um, it, was, it used to be easier. It used to be easier to kind of have people... Um, it got go viral a little bit, you know, or a little like more attraction to something. Whereas now the algorithm changes every two seconds. And unless you're spending money, um, on advertisement, uh, this, the same followers that are following you are not getting the feeds that, um, you're delivering because they're following 1500 people. And there's only so much that Instagram's going to put in their feed at a time, you know? Um, so unless I have, and I've already done tests with this, like literally unless I have $10,000 just in ad spend alone uh, for the next two years, um, that has nothing to do with market, paying the marketing guys or, or putting the content together or creating the garments or putting the garments in production or uh, photo shoots or anything like that. But if I had $10,000 just to throw an advertisement a month, then I think that you know Ghost Circus would go into a different level. Uh, than it is. But that, in my opinion, I think is forceful. It's forcing it. And I don't want to force. It's like, tell, like as we're going on the, the lines of kids, it's like telling your kid to go to college, um, you know, or, or making them go to college. <laughs> so I just, I, as of right now with social media and stuff, it's fantastic because it, it reaches a lot more people and people share things and people see things. Um, but business wise, um, and to be more transparent, uh, a lot of the other departments had opened up because um, 
even talking to some of my other designer friends and stuff like that, it's very hard. It's not, it's to have a brand and stuff like that and, and even do custom things is, it's not easy. It doesn't necessarily pay all your bills and stuff like that. So um, branching out and doing the, the uh, uh, designing for other companies, like I'm, I design for eight companies, I'm head of manufacturing for all of them. Um, I also uh, have the embroidery stuff, and uh, that's really the bread and butter behind Ghost Circus. Um, what people see on Ghost Circus, like on the Instagram, we do a lot of custom stuff, and we still do a lot of stuff, and we still sell a lot of stuff online. But it's not like, you know, it doesn't. It's not taking over everything. So we've, as a business, um, thinking outside the box, I had to grow. Dep different departments to stay afloat and then all of a sudden word spread and it kind of kicked up a bit and then it's now growing into this different uh energy that has nothing to do with social media it's more like uh, uh just actual real business so if the internet went down i'd still have work you know that's amazing and i love that you've got that you know, no matter what you're gonna have work coming in so Last question. What is something you know now that you wish you knew when you started? That's a fantastic question. But to be completely honest, I wouldn't say, I would say nothing. And the reason why is because when I started, I was so naive. And I was so like, there are some friends that were like, the fashion industry is going to eat you live. You're never going to make it. Don't do it. Just keep doing music, blah, 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 blah. And I just didn't listen to them. And I was just like, no, I'm just, I'm going to have fun, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, whatever. I'm going to see where this goes. And, um, and I was so naive. Like if there's things that I know now, I'm so, I'm, my mind is so jaded in, in the world, that world that I'm trying to teach myself to become not necessarily more naive, but to have the naive heart, you know? So it's like, I still can go, anything's possible and, and, and not have a negative thought on it. Awesome. Hey, you're not the only one that said nothing. So I, I appreciate that. And thank you for the explanation about it. Um, so where can people find you? Where can people find Ghost Circus? And if they want to potentially do some customs with you, what? how can they reach out to you? Sure. If you go to ghostcircusapparel.com uh, or if you're on Instagram, it's ghostcircus and underscore. You can always hit me up at Eli James. And then... Um, our merchandising stuff is ghost circus underscore merch. And if you go to ghost circus merch.com, you can find us there. We have like the Facebook stuff and all that, but that's not necessarily where, uh, where you can find us. <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you for coming on. And, uh, I might be hitting you up about some custom stuff, uh, here in the future. Hopefully we're working Sweet. on a, uh, a line that has to do with urban exploration. And I think that, you know, ghost circus would be a great, way to get that started fantastic yeah we're here for it awesome man all right i'll talk to you later all right that was eli james of ghost circus thank you so much for coming on i had a blast talking to you one of my favorite people and i hardly get to talk to him and it's so great to be able to not only chat with him about how he got started and about his brand but it was good to catch up with him so thank you again eli for coming on the podcast if you guys enjoyed this episode do me a massive favor and leave some feedback for me if you leave feedback you get a signed photo prank, guys. I take really cool photos at really cool places, and I would like to give you one of those prints for your wall, for your locker, for your school, your office, or wherever else you might decorate with a photo print. Your feedback helps the podcast grow, and it helps other people find us. So in order to say thank you, I like to give you guys signed photo prints. So if you do leave some feedback, head over to Instagram at Project Freelance and send me a DM. I need your address so that I can send you that photo print. But yeah, thank you guys for doing that. If you're new to the podcast, hit that subscribe button so you're notified every single week whenever I upload, which is every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, just in time for your lunch hour. And if you guys live anywhere else, you get to watch it on your or listen to it on your commute home. We are also on YouTube, by the way. I do have a YouTube channel if you guys prefer to consume your content on YouTube. But if you're listening to this, I assume you've already found a platform to listen to it on. So I guess I don't really need to say that. <laughs> cool. I will talk to you guys next week on another episode of Project Freelance. This has been the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, tell somebody about it. They want to know about it too. Trust me. And uh, hit up Eli if you need any customs made. I love wearing his stuff and I can't wait to get some more of it.
So I hope you guys have a great week and I will talk to you next Monday on Project Freelance. Stay strong, keep enduring, go out, go create something and pick up some merchandise. Links down in the description. Thank you guys.